Hello, I'm your host, Peter Komandowski, and welcome to Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. Today, we're talking about overdose response strategies in the face of a persistent and growing rate of overdose deaths in America. We're joined by Kevin Winker, Drug Intelligence Officer for the Midwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. He focuses on Iowa, and he'll update us on the continuing epidemic of drug overdoses and the strategies being employed to save lives. Kevin, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Peter. Happy to be here. Um, Yeah, my name is Kevin Winker. I'm the Drug Intelligence Officer for Iowa for the Midwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, also known as Midwest HIDA. Prior to that, I had a 32-year career with the Iowa Department of Public Safety, started as a trooper in eastern Iowa, Uh, About a year later, transitioned into our Division of Narcotics Enforcement as a special agent, worked undercover narcotics for about five years, and then transitioned into the Division of Criminal Investigation. And in 2021, I retired from the department as Director of Investigative Operations, which gave me oversight of our DCI, our Narcotics Division, our Intelligence Division, and our State Fire Marshal Division. So I've been doing this a little over a year for, for Midwest HIDA and uh, focusing on how we can reduce fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses in the state. That's really commendable, especially in light of the fact that as hard as everyone's working and as many fires as we can put out, the number of threats, especially from fentanyl, seem to be not only eradicating many of our gains, but making the issue even worse. Um, Can you give us a little understanding of why fentanyl has become so powerful in its ability to create such havoc in our communities? Well, fentanyl is a is a dangerous drug. Um, it's, you know, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we were dealing with the crack cocaine epidemic. And at that point, you know, the thought was, hey, don't even try it once because you can get addicted by just one use of crack cocaine. Well, with fentanyl, it goes beyond that. And just one use can kill you. And so um, it just demonstrates how much more dangerous this particular drug is um, when taken in an illicit fashion. So it's it's heartbreaking to hear stories where somebody you know uses it once, or maybe it's just their second or third time, and um, they end up in a fatal overdose. Yeah, I, th- I think one thing that's really impressed me is when you look at the supply chain and you look at the changes, you know, somebody said, well, you, you, you'd have to have a, a quarter cup to half a cup of cocaine to kill you. You need like a shot glass of heroin to kill you. Um, or maybe not quite that much, but a quarter of a shot glass. And then they said, and you take a look at uh, how many opioids it takes to kill you, which is, you know, a, vi- a visible amount. You'd have to be, you know, looking a lot. And then they show you a vial of how much fentanyl it takes to kill you. And there's a grain of sand in there a grain of sand that we know it's not pharmaceutical companies, it's not sanctioned laboratories. These are drug dealers mixing stuff where as much as a, as a grain of sand can be deadly in the product, um, which to me raises a huge red flag on anybody seeking opioid-based or, or heroin or opioid or even fentanyl directly um, in the black market. I mean, at this point, you're risking your life every time you try it. Is that really what we're seeing? Every time, uh, every time you try it. And and beyond that, what we're seeing is fentanyl being put into other illicit drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine. So people think they're buying methamphetamine or cocaine when in fact they're actually getting a shot of fentanyl in there and they, they didn't even ask for that. So they don't even know um, that they're they're taking the substance, but that's that's the illicit drug market. You you really don't know what you're getting, uh, no matter what your uh, particular dealer would tell you. So fentanyl has really become that inexpensive and that proliferous. So to make money, drug dealers are willing to take the risk that some of their customers die. Yeah, and you know they're they're like any other business. They want repeat customers, and they're relying on the fact that 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 fentanyl, because it is an opioid creates kind of a euphoric effect, even in combination with other drugs, which uh, if if you go without the opioid, then you start going in withdrawal. So you you want to replace that. Um, The problem is it's killing people. And they, I think the drug dealers understand that, but they're looking at trying to get as many people hooked on it as they can to keep coming back for the same substance. You know, I've had the opportunity to meet with a lot of parents that lost children. 
And it is absolutely amazing to me how many children were lost at one of the first uses of an opioid where fentanyl has become deadly. Where young children going to a party experimenting for the first time are then dead. What is it going to take to get the message out to, to kids to stay away from this drug? What do you feel as a, as, as a, as a parent, you know, as a person? What, what's it going to take to knock some sense into people reaching out for these drugs? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a one we're trying to address across the board, you know, as, as being a member of a, of a two person team here in Iowa for the overdose response strategy, um, I'm the public safety partner on this team and I have a public health analyst partner on the team. And together we're working with law enforcement agencies, we're working with public health organizations, and we're working with non-governmental organizations to try and come up with those best strategies to deal to, to, to actually answer that question. Well, we're going to take a short break and come back and talk with Kevin about those overdose response strategies and find out what they mean for you and your community. See you all after the break. You don't want to miss this. The black truck. Hey, Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Oh, is it overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call a car. That's a smart idea. So, yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're going to get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm going to get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. While a lot is changing in our world, at Mediacom, our focus remains the same. Making sure you have the fastest, most reliable connection possible. During this critical time, we know your needs are changing. You may be working or learning from home, relying on telemedicine, or finding new ways to keep everyone entertained. If you need more speed, call or go online, and Mediacom will double your speed immediately for as low as $10 more a month for one year. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid, my kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. We're talking with Drug Intelligence Officer Kevin Winker about the efforts to save lives in the face of an epidemic of drug overdoses. Kevin, you know, you have this opioid response strategy thing going. Tell us a little bit about how that works and how the average person is impacted by that. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, I'm, I'm one of a two-member team here in Iowa. I'm the Drug Intelligence Officer, and I'm the one that is supposed to liaison with public safety officials. And I have a counterpart that's a public health analyst that is intended to liaison with the public health side of this. And, you know, as we know, no one side is going to help resolve this issue. It's going to take cooperation. It's going to take collaboration between public safety and public health, basically enforcement to try and address the supply side of this issue. And then the public health side dealing with treatment and recovery um, to deal with the other side of that issue. But it's really going to take two. We, we need to reduce the uh, amount of illicit drugs coming into the state that are causing these overdoses. But we also need to be able to have programs available that um, can take a drug user out of that environment and put them in a, in a treatment and recovery situation. So the strategies that the ORS or the overdose response strategy is implementing is really based on collaboration and, and efforts along those lines. So from the public safety side, a lot of what I did initially in my first year was ensure that there was naloxone available for law enforcement agency and public safety officials across the state. That if an agency wanted naloxone, they were in a position to get naloxone. Right now, the Iowa Department of Public Health is providing naloxone free to any law enforcement agency within the state that wants to um, carry that. Um, along with that, there are issues of policies in that. So we put together a little kit for law enforcement agencies if they want it about, you know, here's a policy that you can go by to have a naloxone program. 
There's a uh, there's a training opportunities to train your officers on it, and then how to report out on it, and also get access to it so it's free. Um, so that's been very um, effective. I think over 90% of law enforcement officers in the state are currently carrying the lock zone or have access to it on the job. Um, you know, there's also been some. I'm sorry. There's been some perception in the street that naloxone is sort of like a miracle drug and saves you from dying from an overdose. But on the other side, when we talk to parents and, and people that have been near victims of an overdose, they say that they die very quickly. I mean, when they take a, high, a toxic level of fentanyl, they're, they're out very, very quickly. What's the window of opportunity from the time you recognize somebody's in an overdose, which happens apparently very quickly once you ingest the fentanyl, to getting the naloxone for it to actually work? Or is there, you know, if it takes more than 10 minutes, is it too late? I, I don't know. Is, is there some relationship there? You know, I don't I don't know the exact time from taking a fatal overdose to actually the onset of death. Uh, you know, what I will say is if if you suspect somebody is in an overdose and is unconscious, it's not it's not going to hurt them to administer naloxone um, that you're better off administering it. The other thing you have to recognize is it may not just take one dose. So you could you could administer a, uh, a dose of naloxone, revive them. Um, but there could be so much fentanyl in the system that they could go through that naloxone and they could they could crash again. And so most naloxone packs come with two doses. So you have that. But then the important thing is to get them to the emergency room as quick as possible to get them under the care of a physician. You know, when we talk about children and many, many young adults and children have died from overdoses of fentanyl. Um, there is a sure way to solve the problem that doesn't require naloxone. That's not to do the drugs, not to take the fentanyl. Do we see a climate in our in Iowa that there are more and more kids experimenting with drugs like this? Is it getting bad enough that we need to start really looking strongly at, at the prevention side of this in, in a more emphatic way so that we can keep them from making these tragic mistakes? Well, I would say this. I mean, Iowa um, is a pretty safe state whether it's crime statistics, um, overdose rates, or anything else. I've got a couple of statistics here. We're the sixth lowest in, a, in illicit drug use within the state amongst all states, and the fifth lowest in the rate of overdose deaths. Now, that's no consolation to a family member or a parent that has lost a child to an overdose, but Iowans are generally pretty good about following the rules and working together on issues. So, um, you know, as far as just general crime goes in Iowa, we live in a pretty safe state. You know, as far as strategies dealing with um, children, you know, I think I don't have the answers for that. I, I think uh, raising confident, um, goal-oriented children uh, is, a, is a positive thing. In that if, if your goal is to, to, to grow up and be a professional golfer or a physician or an attorney or whatever it may be, you know, illicit drugs are not an avenue to get to those goals. And so how we best convey that message and deal with children, you know, I'm not the expert on that, but um, those are my thoughts on that anyway. Well, those are important thoughts. We're going to take a short break, and afterwards, we're going to ask Kevin to talk about more of the projects and initiatives his team are, is working on, some of the success stories. Stay tuned. We'll see you after the break. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? Why? My. Oh. No, <laughs> you can't. Every second, 127 new devices connect to the internet. You can feel it happening. Our digital world expanding with every breath. We're entering a whole new era of connectivity, and Mediacom will be ready to power it. With one of the nation's first 10G platforms, we'll be bringing you more speed, more capacity, more security, and the power to do more than you ever dreamed possible. You told me not to talk to strangers. You told me not to cross the street without looking both ways. You told me not to touch the stove. 
You told me not to do drugs. You told me not to drink and drive. You gave me so many messages about how to stay safe. Why didn't you keep me safe by properly storing your gun? Welcome back to Surviving Bad. We are talking with Drug Intelligence Officer Kevin Winker about the many ways drug trafficking and overdose incidents are impacting public safety. Kevin, tell us a little bit about that. Well, what we're trying to do um, early on here is get better data as it relates to overdoses uh, that are occurring within the state. And it's really coming from both the public safety side and the public health side. Um, we need to work together. We need to share data. Um, and sometimes that can be a challenge in, in a world that, where we have certain laws and guidelines about who can see what data at what time. But to make good decisions about issues, we need accurate and timely data so that we know how to respond or build responses based on the data. So th there's a lot of data all over the place, whether it's from emergency response on the street, whether it's from treatment or whether it's what we're seeing from our law enforcement community is to do, how do we take that data and, and bring it all together so that we can start to make good decisions, policy decisions about how we want to address the issue. Um, you know, from a law enforcement side, you know, again, I mentioned they're, they're working on the supply side, but they do respond to overdoses. They do investigate overdose deaths as potential crimes, um, which they should be doing. And um, you're looking at how do you take that data and marry that up with the public health data to look at what may be our best strategies. But we're, we're really in the early stages of trying to take the data that we know is out there and be able to bring it into a centralized location so that we can look at it. And there are some systems that can help us do that. There's one that was de developed by the um, Washington Baltimore HIDA program called OD Map, And it allows people to do real time um, entries into a system, uh, whether you're a first responder, you know, you're, you're on an ambulance, you're law enforcement, you're a firefighter. If, if you respond to an overdose, if you administer an naloxone, it takes that information, puts it into a real time system. So you can then actually map it out. And a system like that can be beneficial because then it allows you to look at clusters of things. So if you see a spike in overdoses in a particular area, you can notify law enforcement or law enforcement can become aware. Hospital emergency rooms can be aware. The ambulance um, services can be aware to make sure that they're having a lock zone in a particular area because we're seeing a spike in overdoses. So it's being able to take data like that and really use the data to make good decisions. You know, a lot of parents count on public safety to keep the world safe for their kids, whether it's on the roads or schools, anywhere. Um, and so there's two sides of this equation. There's a prevention side where we count on parents to have dialogue with their children, and we count on the work you're doing to stop the trafficking and, and to get the safety things out there that need to be out there to protect our kids. What, what would you say to parents about the messages they need to give their kids about these drugs? I mean, short of, short of um, the fact that we, we, we know it's deadly, but kids take risks and parents don't know much about fentanyls and things like that and probably don't even think their kids come close to this stuff. Um, what are you seeing out there? Well, I, I think a good strategy is always educating yourself. The, um, the Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy here in Iowa has a great web page full of many resources if you wanna educate yourself about drug use, and not only drug use, but alcohol use, tobacco, anything like that, to become educated as a parent. And, you know, personally, I believe that you have to be willing to have those conversations with your kids as well, um, rather than, you know, just sticking your head in the sand and just thinking that it's, it won't happen to me. You really have to put yourself out there, I believe, um, with your kids and, and don't be afraid to have those discussions. You'd be surprised at what they'll tell you as to what's going on in their schools um, and just trying to reinforce that, that message of, hey, you've got a bright future. Um, you know, make good decisions. Now, is it, would it be safe to say that about every street or any opioid type drug a kid would reach out for 
through channels that aren't a doctor's prescription are basically all potentially deadly, there is no real Absolutely. safe street drug. Absolutely. And, and like I said previously, you may reach out for a, a, a drug and unknowingly there could be fentanyl in it. So regardless of what you're buying in an illicit scenario, um, you don't know. I mean, when I was working undercover as, as an agent, you know, I'd be, you know, trying to buy cocaine, but they were selling me methamphetamine um, or vice versa. You know, they're, they're, they'll, they're there to sell what they have. And even the person you're buying from uh, may not even know that there's fentanyl in it as well. But we know that uh, these combinations are occurring um, regularly. And when we're seeing overdose deaths, um, the, the trend is towards there's fentanyl in it, whether it's fentanyl alone or fentanyl within a mixture of something else. So um, regardless, uh, it, you're putting yourself at risk every time you do that. Is this the deadliest illegal drug in, in Iowa at this point at this time? Um, I listen, methamphetamine is still a huge issue here in Iowa. We're, we're seizing, um, vast amounts of methamphetamine and at, at a 97, 98% purity, uh, psychostimulant overdoses are, are on the rise as well, whether it's from methamphetamine or cocaine, but fentanyl is, is right up there and probably, um, it's probably a more deadly drug, but because of the vast amount of methamphetamine on, on the street, and now we're seeing the mixtures of methamphetamine and fentanyl, you know, I would, I would really put those two together, um, as far as the issues occurring here in Iowa, methamphetamine has been a problem here in Iowa for 30 years and it will continue to be fentanyl is the latest thing but now that they're combining fentanyl and methamphetamine they are both dangerous and you just don't know what you're getting um, when you're buying that on the street we're going to take a short break we're going to invite officer winker to share some final comments insights and advice stay tuned this could help you save a life you don't want to miss this see you after the break Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. Hey, Bobo. Do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome back. Today on Surviving Bad, we're talking about overdose response strategies in the face of a persistent and growing rate of overdose deaths in America. Let's see what advice Kevin Winker from Iowa has to share. Kevin, the stage is yours. You know, I, I would say the, the biggest thing that I would tell people is when it, as it relates to our, our younger generation, don't be afraid to say something. If, if you see something going on in your school, you see something occurring with your friend or, or an acquaintance, you know, we're, we're supposed to be looking out for each other. That's what Iowans do. We're, we're good at that. And I think we teach our kids that at an early age, but it's, it's giving them the confidence to say, hey, something's not right with my friend. Something's going on. I'm hearing things at school, but we really need to empower them to say something so that somebody with the, the authority to do something can step in and really figure out what's going on. 
You know, I used to tell people that when I worked in the intelligence world, we don't necessarily need to be right. We just need to be reasonable because we would talk to people and they're like, well, I didn't know if it was going on or not. Well, you don't, but let law enforcement look at that in the intelligence type setting when we were dealing with actual violent threats. But in the school setting, tell a parent, tell a teacher, tell somebody so that somebody can look into it and determine, hey, maybe nothing's going on with your friend. There's just another issue going on. Uh, and it may not be you know, drug related or anything like that. But at the end of the day, you've noticed a change in somebody. So, so be empowered and have the confidence to say, hey, there's something going on. I don't want to see anything bad happen to my friend. I'm going to tell somebody to, to, to make sure that nothing does happen. And, and maybe we have an opportunity to intervene and stop something bad from happening. Yeah, you know, when you and I were young growing up in school, the things that could kill us were not around like they are today. The, the ways that a child could die innocently by accident or even sometimes not by accident have expanded to the point where, you know, now our doctors keep us healthier longer. We're, we're supposed to live longer from a health perspective, but these risks that come out of the blue and the way they're propagated by things like social media and, and, and trafficking in the communities have made this the riskiest environment you could ever imagine for children. As an adult, how does that feel? I mean, what's it like to look at a world that's gotten so much scarier for kids? Well, I try and stay positive, number one, and realize that my parents felt the same way and their parents felt the same way, that our kids are growing up in the most dangerous time ever. And I do feel that way, but I believe my parents felt that way too and my grandparents felt that way. Um, you know, and I, I keep going back to, you really need to educate yourself and and key, kids need to understand the threats that are out there, um, whether deliberate or non-deliberate. Like I said, with this, with this whole fentanyl thing, you may think you're buying one thing or a different pill, but it could be something completely different. And just understanding that just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean that's exactly what is in this particular um, drug that they may be selling you. And so, and that's a hard thing for, for, for kids to do is, um, you know, especially if they, if, if they are using and they've used it before to understand that, hey, just because you've used it two or three times before doesn't mean that you're gonna you're make it through that fourth usage. And, and prevention is always gonna be, you know, the best if, if you can um, find a way in another alternative to, to not use drugs at all is the best thing. Um, but I, you, you've, if you are seeing that, you, reaching out for help or talking to a friend and allowing for there be, to be some type of opportunity to intervene before something bad does happen. You know, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for pointing out how good a job Iowans are doing to be one of the lowest rates of overdose deaths and, and substance use in the country. Um, and thank you for continuing to work on a problem to get us even lower and keeping our communities and families safe. Thank you all for joining us today. Check out our website, ahealthyiowa.org, and keep your eye on Mediacom MC22 for our next episode of Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. On Mediacom MC22, your local programming leader. Mm -hmm.